Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started then that way. We're not holding up the process. So um, our third presenter in this delightful British Lit Fest <laughs> is Melanie Bradley. Melanie grew up in Ballon, Nevada, and she moved to Fort Smith in 2012. Um, she enrolled as an English major at UAFS as a transfer her sophomore year in fall 2019, completing her first semester with a 4.0. Um, and then she was immediately snapped up by the Miles Friedman Honors Program, because Dr. Seiland had hit us bottom. Um, the following semester. Um, she's working to publish her first manuscript and she plans to attend graduate school, um, although next year she'll be working at a charter school in Fallon, Nevada. Um, Melanie's hobbies include watercolor painting, book binding, and collecting fountain pens. She also has two delightful cats. Um, she's involved in a few small cultivated community groups and participates yearly in National Novel Writing Month. She is also a writing center tutor, um, and she is graduating this Aww. spring. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about plausibility and Jane Austen. Um, when you read Austen's works, especially if you've read her predecessor, Frances Burney, and her contemporary, Mariah Edgeworth, thanks for the good introduction, <laughs> um, Austen's work breathes like fresh air. She's doing the same kinds of novels, they're novels of manners and courtship plots, but she's doing something new, and so they feel refreshing, even from a 21st century perspective. And there's a lot of reasons she does that that I'm going to get into. There's a couple words, a few or more than a couple, um, that I'm going to be using to describe what Austin is doing, and I want to make sure that they're understood in the way that I'm using them. So in the context of my presentation, realism is not meant as the literary movement, but merely how a text is interpreted by the reader, how realistically characters behave or places are described. When I talk about Austin's work as a fantasy, I don't mean anything fantastical or supernatural. I simply mean something that is pretend, especially if it's unlikely to consistently happen, like happy endings. <laughs> um, when I use the word plausible, which is going to be the most common word in this presentation, um, I mean the marriage of believability and realism. And believability is merely the general measure of how well a reader can believe in a person, action, or event. So when we dive into the conversation about Austin's realistic and believable writing, um, scholar Mary LaSalle raises three very good points. The first is that Austin's characters are communicative. They are useful contributors to the plot through their dialogue. She points out that Austin makes exactly intelligible to us the symmetrically posed, precisely interrelated happenings that she chooses for narrative patterns through the talk of her characters, even the most unpromising of them. Secondly, LaSalle describes how deliberate and natural Austin is with the speech of her characters, noting that whatever the characters say, their communications never appear to come from the author's own fund of knowledge because they so faithfully observe the idiom of the character through whom they reach us. And third, LaSalle points out that Austin walks a fine line with the details of her work. She probably used almanacs and roadbooks to ensure that the specific details were correct, but she's sparing and giving out that information. LaSalle draws on the evidence provided in Austin's remaining manuscripts and the details from what is left of Austin's letters, which usually is some in the form of advice to her niece, Anna, who was also writing. When we jump deeper into the conversation, a lot of scholars talk about a lot of different realisms. Um, and certainly a case can be made that Austin is doing any or all of these things, but the bottom line is, is that Austin was doing it realistically. Ray Grainer uh, discusses sympathetic realism in Austin in the second chapter of her book, Sympathetic Realism in 19th Century British Literature, which is a really cool book. Um, she raises a valuable point about the importance of sympathy to realism. A writer will be more successful in achieving plausibility if they can engage their reader's sympathy. However, she doesn't go any deeper into the analysis of how Austin does this. Virginia Woolf, who we stand, um, <laughs> she wrote an essay titled Jane Austen um, for her collection of essays published as The Common Reader. And she remarks on the smallness of Austen's plots. 
She's consistent in her assertion that Austin is a master in the discrimination of human values, and she fully recognizes that Austin wrote novels of character and that she wrote them realistically. And while Wolf recognizes these aspects, she doesn't dig any deeper into the particulars of how Austin achieves plausibility. In her essay, Jane Austen, The Adventure Series Novel, Catherine Sutherland points out that some of Austen's specific contributions to the novel include her ability to reproduce conversation as the probable exchanges between morally fallible human beings and the inwardness of the heroine whose complex life replaces the less probable adventures in the body of her conventional counterpart, like Belinda. <laughs> also, what specifically points out the deliberateness of Austin's accuracy and language, citing, as I will, the letters that she wrote to her niece on it. William H. McGee discusses in his essay, The Instrument of Growth, Courtship, and Marriage Plot in Jane Austen's novels, how Austen worked with and developed the courtship plot, and how the ways in which she adapted it to her own uses led to more realistic plots. He describes the way in which Austen followed the conventions of the genre in Sense and Sensibility, which leads to that really dissatisfying end. <laughs> um, he points out how she slowly works through um, the conventions of the genre in, or the limitations in Mansfield Park. She's definitely struggling with following them and pushing back against them throughout that novel. And then he identifies that she has achieved dynamic structure in Persuasion, using the courtship plot to move away from tradition and into a new social milieu. And now, since I want to <laughs> that in, I'm going to discuss the combination of strengths that I think place Jane Austen above her contemporaries and into the realm of genius. Here's my thesis, guys. Jane Austen is bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. So a prominent feature in all of Austen's works is the heroine's family. And unlike many popular novels of the day, including Evelina, um, Austen populated her novels with the heroine who had some kind of significant family life. Eleanor and Marianne have their mother, a fairly useless brother, and friendly relations. <laughs> the Bennets need no introduction. <laughs> 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 Fanny Price, who comes the closest to the stereotypical orphan trope found in these novels, um, lives with her aunt, uncle, cousins, and has a whole house full of family that she returns to later on. And Anne Elliot even has her father, her sisters, and extended family with whom she can socialize with. Evelina, on the other hand, um, exemplifies the popular trend. Her father has abandoned her, her mother is dead, she is reliant on a kind, elderly, ineffectual, and distant guardian. The families in, of Austin's heroines are not useless filler either. Each family serves a bigger purpose in the story, or as much purpose in the story as any other character interaction. Mrs. Dashwood is a kind, yet flighty and ineffectual mother, largely leaving the responsibility of the family to Eleanor and encouraging Marianne's flights of fancy which almost ends very tragically. Uh, Mr. Bennett's reluctance to do anything more than sit back and be abused by his family, especially <laughs> under the influence of his nonsensical wife, has direct results in Lydia's scandalous behavior and adds undue stress to both Jane and Elizabeth as they try to parent their younger siblings. Fanny is generally treated as nothing more than a servant by her family, and it is the kindness of a single cousin that ends up shaping the entirety of her theming for the whole novel. And Anne's family belittles her and dismisses her, offering her far less respect than she offers them. And it's only once Anne is out from underneath their continual influence that she begins to embrace her own desires. It's these complex and interwoven family dynamics that are far more relatable to readers than the fortunate orphan, and it starts to create a greater sense of realism in the text. Furthermore, all the characters that Austen fills her novels with come across as natural and realistically as if they've been modeled on real people. And in fact, many of the comments Austen received from her contemporary readers state just that. A review of Pride and Prejudice states that Elizabeth Bennet is supported with great spirit and consistency throughout. 
comments regarding Mansfield Park, which Austin recorded herself, include such observations as, the characters are natural and well supported. And while the common reader might not be an expert, Walter Scott, famed writer himself and a contemporary of Austin's, wrote in a review that Mr. Bennett is one of the portraits from ordinary life that shows our author's talent in a very strong point of view. And he relates how a friend of his was recognized as the original of Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Next, Austin limits her settings to her famous three or four families in a country village, something new enough in Mansfield Park. By imposing these limitations on herself, Austin is able to exert a greater control over who appears in a scene and what they're doing there and severely limits the chance that characters or events will ever force her to write something that stresses plausibility. And this allows her to focus her story on her characters to ensure that they behave consistently and therefore as plausibly as possible. In contrast to this, Evelina goes from the country to the city and then cavorts all over <laughs> London and it gives her exactly the kind of strange opportunity to accidentally run into her long estranged aunt. And this happenstance begins a convoluted spiral of acquaintance that leads Evelina into saving a young man from killing himself and later finding out that they are siblings, <laughs> etc. <laughs> that convoluted plot begins with an event that stresses plausibility and then proceeds to work its way further and further from realism and believability until it is nowhere near plausible. Austin, with her limited settings, reduces the likelihood of such unrealistic events needing to be necessary to move the story. And by removing the potential for extravagant plot points, Austin almost limit, also limits what's possible in her plots. This connection between setting and plot is clear. And while I suppose like an incredibly, amazingly, unbelievable writer could pull off a large convoluted plot in a small setting, it's more plausible that a small plot suits a small plot setting better. Even in a large setting like Belinda, a large plot fails. Mariah Edgeworth is trying to do too much with too many characters in too many places and is trying to quite unsubtly hammer home her pet moral, which is a good moral. <laughs> <laughs> but it all ceases to be very plausible very early on and it grates on the reader the longer you read the text. Another benefit to keeping her plot small is that it allows Austin plenty of space for the complex interiority of her characters. And this interiority is critical to the realism that Austin is presenting because it is the single most humanizing aspect of her stories. The interior, this interiority isn't unheard of. Readers got a lot of Evelina's interiority because her novel is um, in an epistolary format, so it is almost always full of its own words. But Austin delivers her character's thoughts and experiences as the character is having them, and that gives the reader the opportunity to almost live vicariously through them. And it's through this close character-reader relationship that the reader's sympathy is most easily sparked and then you draw forth the most realistic reactions from the reader and make the character's actions and responses all the more plausible. Another additional vital aspect of her writing is Austin's mastery of language and the consistency with which she wields it. This ties all other aspects of her novels together and cements them as being realistic in a way that no one else had yet achieved. Sutherland is aware of Austin's ability to reproduce something as near as possible to real conversation with its own peculiar deceits and fictions, and LaSalle notes that Austin must have had a fine and true ear. LaSalle further observes that Austin uses syntax and phrasing to suggest variance in social standing rather than vocabulary. She uses the example of the elder Miss Steele in Sense and Sensibility as compared with the lower class Browns in Evelina noting that the elder Miss Steele, her speech doesn't differ in vocabulary from the speech of the Dashwoods as the Brantons does from Evelina's. And when a character communicates, whether it's through speech or a letter, there's a distinct style that belongs only to that character. The consistency and the idiosyncrasies of her character's speech carries over into her insistence and the consistency of their characterization. 
While readers can witness Austin exercise this skill in her novels, she offers explicit demonstration of her eye for consistent characterization in the letter she sends to her niece, Anna. She includes such notes as, you must not let her act inconsistently. <laughs> Uh, maintaining this characterization is one of Austin's greatest strengths. She allows her characters to grow as they experience things and gain more knowledge, as Elizabeth's evolving opinion of Mr. Darcy demonstrates, but she does so without changing the essential core of the character and the voice that they use. Elizabeth is still the witty, sharp woman she was after she agrees to marry Mr. Darcy. She was before she well, when she first refused him. Um, she has simply learned to temper her prejudice based on her experiences and knowledge. Similarly, Anne Elliot is still the kind, thoughtful, and soft-spoken woman she was at the start of Persuasion. She has just learned to evaluate the choices she makes free from the influence, the self-serving influence of the people around her based on her own previous experiences and the opportunity to experience part of the world away from those influences. Austen's insistence on consistency isn't just limited to characterization. She is firm in her insistence in accurately representing those details which ought to be accurately represented, which are chiefly the rules of the society and world in which she and her niece, Anna, were writing in. And again, Austen demonstrates this most readily in those letters to her niece. Um, I like this one. It's very clear. Lady H is Cecilia's superior. It would not be correct to talk of her being introduced. Cecilia must be the person introduced. Austin always maintains an eye for this type of detail. She is insistent on the correct observation of the social rules, bringing it up multiple times to Anna, and therefore allowing us in the 21st century to absolutely believe her representations in her novels. She weighs the likelihood of a character's action, not only against their own internal motivations, but against the real world probability, ensures her characters are always behaving plausibly. And with the use of road books, she's able to ensure accurate travel times and distances <laughs> between what locations her characters do travel to. And this encompassing consistency in the accurate representation of that which is true and likely is a key component to the completely natural and realistic texture of all of Austin's writing. Now, I could probably go on for like six <laughs> more hours, <laughs> um, but I'm just gonna leave you with this. Beginning at an early age, Austin began mimicking and experimenting with the narrative tools she found around her. And through this experimentation, she developed a style uniquely her own. It is the combined implementation of all these small things that she did, her realistic and relatable heroines and their families, the limitations she set in both setting and plot, and her mastery of language and consistency in everything, <laughs> that really make Jane Austen stand out amongst her contemporaries and have helped maintain her lasting and very well-deserved popularity. criticism was pretty rough on Fanny Price. Like yes. everybody hates Fanny. I hates love Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> like the first time I read Fanny's remark, I was like, oh, I love her. She's so sweet. Yeah. She's stuck in the middle. She's trying so hard yeah. to do everything. And she doesn't know what to do. And I really felt when you were talking about sympathy, that was what I was thinking. I was like, I have a lot of sympathy for Fanny and how she's pulled into her directions. And then I started reading the criticism. I was like, oh, yeah. WTF? <laughs> like, what? Why, why on the Fanny cake? So do you have a thought on why Fanny has failed to elicit sympathy from certain readers, although the more enlightened readers obviously <laughs> respect Fanny. 
<laughs> I do, personally, because I, I feel both ways. I have a great deal of sympathy for Fanny. I also get really freaking irritated for her. I wish she would do something. Um, I think that it goes back to that comment um, that William H. McGee observed, is that at that time, Mansfield Park falls really close to the middle of Austin's repertoire. And she's, she's still working through her own personal issues with the form she's writing in, and she feels stuck. Um, I'm going to try to go back to the quote because it's really good. Um, he points out here, by principles there's no chance that Edmund or Fanny would marry anyone but each other mm -hmm. because that is what the courtship plot demands. Mm -hmm. These two characters were designed mm -hmm. to be married. However, a lot of us don't like them together. <laughs> a lot of us really wish that Fanny would have married Mr. Crawford. Yes. He's much more interesting in doing that the character. Yes, I'm, I'm on board with that. <laughs> so, if readers feel otherwise, Jane Austen has raised their doubt. Mm -hmm. And that is because she herself is working through the limitations of her form. She doesn't want Fanny and Edmund together yeah. necessarily, but she is forced to do that because that is what the form of a courtship no novel says has to happen. Mr. Crawford is just a little bit too out there, a little too exciting, a little too worldly yeah. for Fanny Price, the virtuous heroine, to marry. So is this part of her rejection of this other yes. tradition of Belinda? And yeah, so we're yes. trying not to do that, even though a lot of the setup is that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So she's and she is she's working through this, and you know, the the rest of this where she does achieve this in persuasion, um, you can see. All of the, the form of the courtship novel is there. You have Anne Elliot, who's very virtuous, very kind, everything that a good woman and wife should be in this time period, but her love interest is Captain Frederick Wentworth, and she rejects him before the novel starts because he's an unsuitable match. And this novel maintains every single aspect of the courtship novel and elevates Wentworth into a position where Anne is able to grow and they are able to come together which is not typical in courtship novels. Wentworth is not of the right social standing. He is not of the right monetary class. He should not be a good match, but she has made him so because she has pushed back against the confines of the courtship plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Um, I think a big point of Avery's presentation was the sort of pushing the boundaries and trying to get the cultural norms to change mm -hmm. through literature. Uh, was that also, or to what extent did Jane Austen also do um, that? At the time that Austen was writing, there was a discussion of what marriage should be, and the courtship novel reflects that deeply. So the idea is that there is like a type of woman and a type of man, and this is who you should strive to be to have a happy marriage. But it's based a lot on class, it's based a lot on money, it's based a lot on a lot of exterior things, which leads to a lot of really unhappy marriages. <laughs> um, lots of people who never speak to their spouse, who cheat on their spouse because there is no satisfaction within the marriage. And as Austin's writing through this whole time period, there's a, a larger discussion within society of Maybe that's not what we should be doing. And that's reflected in Wilson, Wilson Craft, I'm sorry, I totally butchered name, <laughs> and in Belinda of what should a woman be to be a good companion, but also what should go into a marriage to make it a good marriage. And so there's this conversation of should it just be we're the same class, we're of equal financial value, or should it be um, a companionship marriage of people who are suited to each other on an emotional and mental level. And Austin is writing towards that. She achieves it in, in persuasion. And so, yeah, it's it's in dialogue with that, of this, this bigger conversation of, of what we should be doing and how we should be as people and what makes a good and happy marriage. And it isn't, it isn't what society has been saying. So let's push back on that. I will say the one thing she doesn't do is realistically represent her own scenario. She does not. No. no. Where she rejects marriage. Because it's offered to her, but it's not a companionate marriage. It is definitely one of advantage, and then doesn't marry. Mm -hmm. She doesn't go the woman of color route, which is like peace out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eat on out of here. Yeah. Um, she she oh that the courtship plot has to end in marriage, marriage for her. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that 
I think that perhaps, like, I mean, Woman of Color is an anonymous mm -hmm. author, and I think that while that <clears throat> probably got a lot of reasons why, one of them I think is because it doesn't adhere to that marriage ending. Mm -hmm. It really pushes back against the conventions, and I don't think that Austin, for all of her pushing back, was quite at the point where she was comfortable embracing mm -hmm. that level of rebellion mm -hmm. <laughs> against a traditional form. So we talk about how these novels like Evelyn are kind of crazy, right? Like there's just a lot of things that happen. Do you think that Frances Bernie is being self-aware with it? Like, do you think that the novel is self-aware of itself or is it really just thing um, thing? Bernie was writing enough before Austin um, that I, I think I could guess it no. I think that she probably was aware of the tropes she was writing into. There, there's this established form, there are these established expectations. But at the time she was writing, the novel of character was still developing. Mm -hmm. And really, Austin was one of the, the people who really pushed the novel of character forward by leaps and bounds. And so at some level, like Bernie had to write a crazy plot because that's how novels moved. Mm -hmm. That's how stories got told. There was not a a novel of character at that point. So I think on one level she probably was because you know you are thinking of these stories and writing them down. <laughs> but at the same time, she probably wasn't because that's just how stories were told. Mm -hmm. And so that's just what she was doing. Interesting. I want I we have one quick question back there. Oh <laughs> someone that's ever read Jane Austen. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 to borrow anyone. Um, She's gonna make you start with the training. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm oh, not. Okay. I'm gonna tell you the same thing I told my mom. Start at the beginning and work through them. Okay. Do them in publication order and you can really see the way that Austin's writing improves and grows and the way that she develops her own characters and plots. Oh, and it's, it's magical. It's really magical. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. All right, well, thank you.